We're live? Okay, perfect. All right, we'll call the meeting to order. Is there any declarations of conflict? Seeing none. Okay, seeing none. So, seeing none. I was gonna say, <laughs> I was, I was gonna say yeah. high worship and... Okay, I need approval of the agenda, please. Sure. Okay, moved and seconded, thank you. Adoption of the minutes from the August 3rd, 2021 meeting. Yes. Moved. Yes. Seconded. Welcome, Your Worship. Yes, sir. All right, any business arising from the minutes? At what point do you want uh, additions to the agenda? Uh, well, under the approval of the agenda, we can back up if there's something sure. that you want to add before uh, we approve. I'd just like to uh, uh, have a short discussion on um, dilapidated pro property in okay. the city that we've been trying to work with. Okay. Would that be closed or open, Councillor? Uh, I do, Dr. Councillor, the committee. If it's just a straight. Uh, it's a particular or resident. For a um, cleanup? Yes. In no form as it is at Council. Okay. okay. <coughs> so, it's yeah, sure. Okay, are you okay with that, Councillor yes, Ramsey? Yes, I am. Your Worship, you okay? Councillor Duran, you okay with adding that to the agenda? Okay, perfect. All right, so approval of the new agenda. Good. Yes. All right. Uh, I think we went through business arising for minutes. I don't think we saw any. Your Worship, anything? No? Okay. All right. We're going to have a presentation first before we get into our meeting. The presentation, we have Lorianne and Donna here uh, from Coordinated Access and PEI. And uh, they're going to do a presentation for us uh, this afternoon and take any questions that we may have. So with that, if you want uh, what the floor is yours and then we'll ask any questions when we're when you're done so hi everyone my name is Lorianne McCardle I'm a project manager with the Prince Edward Island government with the Department of Social Development and Housing and this is my colleague Donna Keenan she's the reaching home coordinator with the John Howard Society and uh, we're going to talk about coordinated access it's a federally funded initiative for homelessness and just present to you what we've been working on up till now so um, coordinated access is being managed and organized by quite a large number of NGO and government partners. So the, one of the first things we did was we created our own name and logo to represent the collaborative process that we're working under. So we decided on um, the little logo that's both a house and an envelope to be addressing homelessness PEI. So addressing, meaning that we're helping people who are homeless to get an address, and addressing, meaning that we're working collaboratively together. So this is our little fun play on words, but it really shows the two ways that we're trying to work together to uh, help um, people in need. So uh, Reaching Home is a federally funded initiative under the Government of Canada's um, program. It's the Housing Strategy. Um, so this is a community-based program that they fund. Um, funding happens all across the country. John Howard is the community entity, meaning they receive the federal funding um, for this work here on PEI. In some uh, places around the country, it is municipal government that's a community entity. In some places, it's provincial government. Here, it just happens to be an NGO. So different in all places. Um, so as the community entity, they take the lead on this work. They've got two years to do the full implementation. It started um, April 1st, 2020, right in time for COVID. Uh, we've worked all through that and uh, we're going to be fully operational um, that's the plan anyway by March 31st of 2022 so two years of funding so coordinated access by the federal definition is becoming uh, looking at homelessness through the lens of a more efficient and streamlined way to help communities ensure that clients have equitable and fair access to both services and supports as well as units when they become available. So even though we know there's not always a lot of affordable housing, the services and supports that people need are equally important and again there's often waiting lists for those as well. And then the other side is how do we manage all the data that we know um, and we get to know a client. Um, so HIFAS 4.0 is a new database that the federal government has put in place and made available through license to all the community entities. So 4.0.59.3, because it constantly um, upgrades, 
but it's a new updated information technology system that allows all the community and government partners to enter data on their clients that they're actively working with and so we can each follow each other's clients and be in best position to support them um, so common client information can be shared with the right privacy rights in place so people can't see information that they're not entitled to see and it allows for people to also put the inventory of housing that's available through coordinated access there so we can manage the inventory as well as the clients. <coughs> so the project management team, there's four of us that have been kind of coordinating the work. So Donna and I, uh, Chantelle Worrell is the project sponsor and she's the executive director at the John Howard Society. And then Shelley Cole would be my supervisor at Social Development and Housing, and she now fills the role of the supporting housing manager and does a lot of the federal, provincial, territorial liaison work. So the four of us, of course, can't do this alone, and so we have two teams of people that work with us on this. The governance team would be made up of a membership of the leadership of the NGOs and community um, and government partners. So the people who are in position to make decisions on behalf of their organizations. So these are organizations that either provide shelter or provide supports to clients uh, at risk or dealing with homelessness. So we started out by uh, learning from other provinces. So you know PEI is small. We either tend to be a pilot and lead the way or we tend to be the last one to adopt. In this case, we're the last ones to adopt, but it means that we get to learn from everybody else. And uh, one example is that we're actually coming into HIFAS at a time where they've made huge improvements based on all the experience of other places. So we get to take up where other people have been leading off. Um, we started out by doing a huge amount of planning. This isn't something that'll happen overnight. We've developed our own policies and processes for how everybody's gonna work together. And we've defined things like homelessness, our guiding principles of how we're gonna work together, how we're gonna work with our clients, um, and we've done a lot of like system mapping, which means we're starting to understand better if I come to Canadian Mental Health, what is um, the eligibility criteria to be a client there and what services do they really offer versus all the misconceptions that we might each have about each other. So doing some of that work and doing a lot of training, been offering a lot of different things to um, the staff involved in this, like mental health first aid, trauma-informed care, harm reduction for people who are living homelessness, um, as well as all training that's specific to the work that we'll be doing. The other team that we have is called the service provider team, and this is kind of a mirror, all the same organizations but it's staff from the front lines who really get to work with the clients day by day, and they really get to see and understand um, the issues that they face and what it's gonna take for this work to be successful. So the organizations that sit around our table include John Howard, of course, and the provincial government who's partner in this. So social development and housing has representatives from housing services and social programs the Department of Justice and Public Safety because there'd be a number of people who are homeless who've been incarcerated or had issues with the law. And then of course Health PEI with mental health and addictions because that would be an issue quite a number of people would face. Salvation Army uh, who runs the, with support from the government, the Emergency Housing Line, the Community Outreach Center, Bedford McDonald and Smith Lodge. Blooming House is the out of the cold shelter for women here in Charlottetown. Family violence with their services across the island. Chief Murray Bernard in Lennox, Canadian Mental Health, who are gonna focus their work out of Summerside because of the amount of partners we have in Charlottetown. The Mi'kmaq Confederacy Native Council, Council People with Disabilities. Uh, two weeks ago, the announcement came with the Life House in Summerside, which will be a new transitional and emergency shelter as well. And then the Community Advisory Board and the Rural Advisory Board on Homelessness. So coordinated access, we need to start by thinking about um, what locations uh, and where would staff be that would be accessible to those people who are experiencing homelessness. So I'm sure you guys have had these conversations lots of times, but a lot of people who experience homelessness tend to be in the downtown area. So that's why it makes sense for the Community Outreach Center to be in the downtown area versus putting sites in a place like Stratford where how do people get to those locations. Um, when they come to an access point, they're going to be met with uh, staff that work from a strengths-based approach. So we're taking a positive rather than a deficit approach to working with clients. 
We also recognize that a lot of clients come into homelessness because of past trauma in their lives that they're still struggling to um, deal with. Um, we're going to work from a common set of policies and procedures and standard assessment tools. Uh, we're going to decide up front uh, who will get priority based on how long they've been chronically homeless, um, how they're, um, they're assessed on an acuity level, uh, how the severity, and what other vulnerabilities that might have that put them at particularly higher risk to somebody else. And then a whole process to match clients to services and support to make referrals where it's necessary. And it'll all be directed through a case management approach. And on the uh, HIFAS side, which is our IT platform, it's really about ensuring like all that legal stuff, that we have our user licenses in place, that we have um, a server with all the proper safeguards in place. So we're working with a group called the Affordable Housing Association of Nova Scotia, who've really led the way in Atlantic Canada with this work. Uh, we've got all our data sharing agreements with each of the organizations are in the process of being signed off. Uh, every staff person at every organization will need to sign confidentiality and then there's a common client consent form that regardless of where you go as a client you would sign that same form. All has been reviewed and in compliance with PEI laws. Uh, AHANS is also providing all of our common staff training for this uh, IT platform so everybody gets the exact same training. Um, and then when everybody's good and ready to go, you'll get assigned your credentials and user rights, so username, yet another password, um, the usual things. So when you think about where these places are, where clients are going to go, we've got a mix of sites that are open, which means anyone from the general public can go to those places. You don't have to be a client there. And then we've got some places that are closed um, for obvious reasons. So John Howard and the Housing Navigator with Housing Services are going to be open sites. They will support anybody as a first point of contact. Then if you're um, already a person experiencing violence and you go to Family Violence uh, Prevention Services, Anderson House, Chief Mary Bernard, Blooming House, they're going to take care of just their own clients because one thing they wouldn't want is uh, someone identifying as male coming to one of their sites. And then the Native Council is also going to be a closed site, so they'll take care of people within their membership and living off reserve. Um, then as an open site, the next one will be Canadian Mental Health at Prince County because we really need a site in Summerside as well. And Charlottetown is also going to take it on, but as a closed site because they feel like there's enough other open places um, in this town. Um, and then when these all roll in, Salvation Army will be ready to open at the Community Outreach Centre and again that will be open to anyone who drops in there. And then Lifehouse and Summerside, uh, when they've just hired their first staff, so when they're ready, probably early New Year, um, they'll be open and uh, they're open for business but they'll be a closed site uh, because they're going to take in clients um, experiencing violence as well. So as funnel points, just to give you an idea like what it means to be open and what types of clients might come. So the John Howard uh, Society is an example. So clients might come from the general public who are experiencing homelessness for the first time and have never been connected to any of these agencies. But it might also be MCPEI. Um, so they would uh, support so few clients they don't feel they should be their own access points. So they might um, come in through John Howard. Um, John Howard would have their own clients leaving incarceration and so Tanner as one of their staff are already working within probation services so when they know a client is coming up for release they could start to work well in advance to get that client ready to move out uh, and into their own place if that's possible. And then the same with the housing navigator, like it might be the women at Blooming House um, or mental health and addictions or social programs, Peers Alliance, they wouldn't necessarily have enough clients to be their own access point, so the housing navigator can support them as well. So what will happen when you come into the access point or if you call uh, for service, the very first thing you do with everybody is just make sure they're safe that are they, are they physically safe, are they with somebody that could do them harm, and if they're okay, then we proceed. If they're not okay, we call the police, we call 911, whatever's needed to interact to make sure that person can be safe and then we can move forward. We explain to them what coordinated access is and what we'll be able to do for them. 
If it's possible to divert people away from an emergency shelter, that's actually what we're going to try to do first because all the statistics show that even if you spend one night in an emergency shelter, it's really easy to get into that system and harder to get out of it. So if we can divert you by having you stay with an aunt or uncle for a couple of days or a brother maybe that you haven't been in touch with for a while or a friend, um, we'd like to do that and then we can do intensive case management and support you from there in a much safer way for you. Um, we'll do a quick intake. It's about finding out the most basic things we need to know about you to help support you. And then when we get to know you and we're a little farther into case management, that's when we would do a full assessment and learn far more about you at that point. But we don't rush into that. Um, everything that we learn about you goes into the IT platform. So if I'm working with Greg today, and, but Don is going to work with him tomorrow, Donna can see the notes I've put in. And we can only see it because we're both agreed that we're working with you. If Donna wasn't working with you and she looked at your notes, she could lose her job. And she knows that up front. So she's taking a big risk. The same as any government employee would do signing in to um, like medical lab records uh, that they're not entitled to see. So all that's done up front. Um, then when we get to know you and what you need, we're going to match you um, to the services that are available and do our best to find you a unit. And then the ongoing case management, because one thing we've learned is getting people into a unit is one thing, keeping people in a unit is a whole other ball of wax. And so that actually takes a lot more intensive work than actually just finding the unit. Um, our priority clients mean that we've been working with you and we know that you're ready um, and you've got like your ID, you've got your first and last month's rent, you've got your damage deposit. Um, we're going to work in real time with you and keep everything up to date in our IT platform. And then all those organizations, those names were listed, we're going to meet together every two weeks and names will come forward um, for the next available unit or slot on somebody's caseload and try to support you that way. Um, so you're going to be matched off by the length of time that you've been chronically homeless. So um, by gov the federal government definition, six months within a year or a year and a half within three years makes you chronically homeless and the most high at risk. So th those are the clients we're looking to try to find settlement for first. The acuity is what's based on your assessment score, um, so what your past history has been with addictions, mental health, trauma, um, financial, um, all that kind of stuff. So that would be the next way. And then other things that make you really vulnerable, like uh, health issues that would be called like trimorbidity. So three major health issues makes you um, at very high risk because you're more likely to be the people that emergency services need to be called for. And we're trying to eliminate some of that down a little bit too. So it could have um, some lessening effect on some of the other services ultimately. Um, and then the next big piece of this is actually besides now that we've got all the service providers in the same room and talking to each other, it's about the process of engaging landlords for affordable units. Um, so John Howard Society has um, got funding through the feds to hire a person to be a housing resource coordinator. So Donna and I have already started the process. We've been working with the province through housing services. Uh, working with um, King Square Co-op, working with um, rural and native housing. So we've got connections in a number of places already where people are letting us know that when units become available and when we're ready, that they're ready to work with us as well. Um, but a big part of it is um, getting the right unit matched with the right landlord with the right uh, client. So if we have a client and a landlord, the landlord can say, no, I don't want that client. We've already got a past history that's not very good. The client can also say, I don't think I'm the right person for that unit because I've had a bad relationship with the next door neighbor there. So everybody gets choice in this the best we can. It's proven that that's a way that works best. Um, and then part of it, like I said, is those wraparound services. So we've done um, housing-based intensive case management, and certainly one of the things we learned in that training is it's one thing to get somebody housed, but at two, three, four months from now, people really start to struggle because they're used to being in that pattern of their life that they live when they are homeless and on the street. 
They get up at Bedford McDonald as an example and they know the other guys around them. They go for breakfast together at Salvation Army. They hang out in the downtown. They all end up at the community outreach center. They'll wander back to the soup kitchen for lunch. You know, they've got that same pattern that they go every day and they know all the people around them. Sometimes when they're in a unit, then they're losing all those social connections. So partly it's how do we help people rebuild their lives once they have a unit. So those wraparound services become really, really critical. And then <clears throat> the HIFAS side, again, to come back around to that, this is where we keep all the data. So it's a new IT platform for data management. It's all about privacy, that you can't see anything that you're not entitled to see. Lots of common training that everybody gets. AHANS also does um, all of our maintenance for us, so we don't have to worry about that locally. But one of the things we do have to keep on top of is our good data quality, because data in, data out, if it's not good going in, it's not going to be good what we get out of it. Um, lots of technical and training assistance to make sure we can do a good job, and then help desk both um, here on the island at AHANS and federally, so people will have lots of support. That's us. <laughs> wow. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Okay. So, thank you. And I'll leave that slide up. If you are interested, there's some excellent resources at any of those websites. Um, you can get in touch with Donna at any time, and then I'm available as well. So. Well, Lorian, thank you very much. Great presentation. Um, thank, thank you, you Donna. for having us. <clears throat> any, any questions for yeah. Deputy? So, the housing inventory, so. Um, is there an alignment with the Charlottetown Housing Authority and, and the Hill Park Housing Authorities? That, uh, so we haven't got that far yet. Far yet but yes, thank you. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> we'll make some calls this afternoon to set up some time and, and uh, meet with them and, and discuss what what we might build work out there. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, for sure. Yeah, and John Howard just had their job posting for that role up like two weeks ago, so they're pretty close to having somebody hired. So, and the. Uh, Provincial bridge program. Um, mm -hmm. Is there referrals coming? Uh, yeah, from possibly. Um, the housing navigator also sits on bridge, as so that that's their link to housing services as well. And so one of the things we certainly learned about bridge is that most people who end up at bridge do have housing issues, and that's why the housing navigator was selected to be there. And she's an integral role in the work that we're doing. So I'd imagine that's going to be a strong connection. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. Yeah. Oh, good. Okay. So you see Ashley Gillis there. Yeah. Yes, Mr. Councillor Ramsey. Thank you, ladies. It's fantastic. Uh, do you have any idea? Would you have the numbers of how many homeless there is in Charlottetown? Approximately. So well, we, just we, from we do a good count just in, in the spring. Um, it was different this year again because of COVID. Normally right. we would have a, an, an engagement activity um, that we call a magnet event, which drew a lot of people in where we could <coughs> gather information. But we couldn't do that because of COVID. So we basically did it through file reviews through different organizations. Uh, we did do a street count. The street count didn't show a lot, but that wasn't overly surprising because it's really the hidden homeless that are the hard ones to count. So I think the total number overall was 119, but that would, were people that were staying in transitional housing, um, addiction uh, facilities, different things like that. That's where HIFAS is going to come in really handy to give us some up-to-date, real-time data where we'll know numbers, because that's been the issue with really every level, NGOs, provincial government, federal government, is just not having those fast numbers you know, when you need them. So that will help improve a lot of information. So one of the great videos that uh, an organization called Org Code is um, like a national guru in this work does, the way they talk about homelessness in this work is to think, if this is all the people on PEI that are homeless, and you've got to figure most of them, we've got no idea who they are. Then you do the pit count and you've got a number of people at a point in time that are, are saying that they're homeless. And so that's what you know. All you've got is a number. Then once you start to do coordinated access and people sign the consent form, we have your name. So now we know this much. We know people with their name and they're consenting to do work to um, move out of homelessness. And so then when they get onto the priority list, they're, they're starting that work. 
And so that's when you're going to get to that number of people that are really going to start to mean something. And I think when we start to see success there, more people who are currently like couch surfing or living very precariously are going to start to come forward. And that'll help us with things like overcrowding, especially on reserves. I think that's why so many of the Indigenous organizations are interested in this work as well. So it'll kind of bring other definitions of homelessness into play as we move along. Thank you. So, Mr. Chair, can I just ask, um, you did give a definition of homelessness, like, I think, three years without home, Yeah. right? So I think Councillor Ramsey's question was, if you look at that 119, you're saying they're, they've been out without a home for three years? No, that's what we're yeah. saying. We don't have that exact information. Right. No. Right. No. Some and of them may be staying in, like, for example, the county people at Talbot House that Ident they did fill out a survey, survey where they identified you didn't have a home to go to. Some right. did, of course. So we don't have that exact number of the chronic homeless. Mm -hmm. Right. No. Yeah, just uh, getting back from Halifax last week on Thursday, oh, as yes. you know, the city of Halifax moved in on yeah. a number of parks. Peace yes. mm -hmm. and Harmony, which was the former Edward Cornwallis Park, and started at 7.30 in the morning by 5 o'clock that afternoon when there completing the rounds, it just gained so much uh, mm -hmm. opposition. Yeah. And the issue just, as my, my brother lives in Halifax, okay. it's been going on for the last couple of years. Yes. These structures are, are going up in, in, in these open spaces, tents, mm -hmm. and you know, it came to a conclusion that I didn't, I don't think it was very, didn't look the, like the city or everybody, everyone involved in the enforcement side looked very good on it. Mm -hmm. This is this is my fear is that you know I'm, we're seeing people sleeping along the Confederation Trail. We're seeing yes. people sleeping in parks. Mm -hmm. You know, there's going to be a point where they're going to they'll have to put up a tent yes. or put up a structure. And I I know that you, you talk about uh, working with landlords, but housing, as you know, is mm -hmm. a provincial and a federal responsibility. Yeah. And <coughs> I've been asking, and I know former chair of planning and, and development council Rivera, is that you know the two levels of government have to provide more housing whether it's like similar to Dresden Court or is similar to what we have in Queen Street 407 49 411 Queen Street or Queen Street and Kirkwood Drive like that's mm -hmm. you know we have shelters but St. Mary's house over in Halifax when that was open there were 14 I believe in one room mm. so you're a homeless person you, you, you come to this kind of a situation you, as you said they're with each other all day long mm -hmm. because of, of the, 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 the situation you're in so is there a push for more public housing to, to, to address this need yeah, I think between public housing and affordable housing, right? And I think one of the things, um, not to speak for housing services, but it's likely to be other things that they can support with too, like the uh, rent supplements and things like that. Mm -hmm. So getting people registered and on to social assistance even, and, you know, because some people are just, I don't want to be involved with government, right? And so even trying to break down those barriers to get them into social assistance, getting them their name onto the housing services, some people are just resistant to all of that, and we've got to honor people's choices that they're making. So it's a really tough call, like you can't force people's hand, and yet we can all, all we can do is provide the best that we can and continue to reach out and work with partners. But, but if we provide the inventory, yes, right? And it's and right now if you stay in it's public housing, it's income based. Correct. And of course CMHC is now looking at middle middle income based. Yes. So we have to find a balance to yeah. adjust it or fix it to the family income, twenty five to thirty percent gross yes. income. And just quickly the last question. CMHC the Fitzroy Center is now closed for public is the Fitzroy Center still open for uh, use by clients? Oh, That's Canadian Mental Health Association. CMHC, CMHC yes, which is yes. on Fitzroy Street. Right. It's a yes. center that was open, and I know it closed down because of COVID. But is it available for drop-ins? Um, for that, clients of CMHA is my understanding. Yeah, that's yes. what I believe too. Yeah. But they, there, are, there are apartment units. Correct. But there's also a community center. Is that still open to the public? That I couldn't answer right now. Sure. I'm going to certainly find out, but that's, it's run by CMHA, so I'm not sure if it's open now or not. 
things too. Yeah, yeah you're welcome. So, I mean, in follow up to, to the mayor's comments, I mean, the challenge, I mean, two years ago we had a vacancy rate of 0.02%. Yes. So, you know, we talk about you know, finding landlords that are yeah. that are willing to accept, but there was there was a no no permits available, and again because the vacancy rate was so low, <coughs> it was a bit of a monopoly, if you will, for for landlords. They were able to pick and choose who they wanted mm -hmm. to stay. Um, I mean, one of the keys I think here is is to continue to develop the city. I mean, we we need to keep building. I mean, yes. once that vacancy rate hits that five six percent, then you know market rates yes. drop availability presents itself you know and there's there's much more of an appetite for landlords at that point to to tap into some of these programs mm -hmm. mobile vouchers and things of that nature yes. to be able to so I think you know I think one of the big keys is, is we, we need to continue progressing as a city yeah. and continue to grow to meet the demands and you know I know a lot of people are certainly anti-development but <clears throat> you know a lot of these the same people are <laughs> once complaining that we're not doing anything to uh, right. to help these people out so yeah. you know it's a, it's a double-edged sword yeah. Yeah. so it is difficult right now with the limited numbers that's where our challenges mm -hmm. lie is finding those units and landlords that are willing to take on mm -hmm. the clients that we're working with because we know they can get the ideal client or uh, <coughs> tenant you know? mm -hmm. so that's where our work comes in in this whole system of really Letting the landlord know that we are going to provide those wraparound services to their to that tenant in order to hopefully make it successful. I have to believe there's a there's a correlation between if you look at cities that have low vacancy rates, be it yeah. Vancouver, be it Toronto, be it Halifax, mm -hmm. you know, cities that we can compete with in the sense of vacancy rate, yeah. that they're 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 facing the same issues yeah. yes. at, at a, yeah. a larger magnitude yes. um, than than we are simply because of population. Mm -hmm. But again, I think the key is is to again to continue to, yeah. to build exactly. and grow the city and we'd rather you know find more units and house people than build on the shelters you know right because, <laughs> yes. because, you yeah. Know, yeah. Yeah. Um, that's just a stopgap Sh yep. shelters yes. are just yeah. that's not really want to focus yeah. yes. we can get people housed and keep those shelter numbers yeah. is is there enough beds well blooming house right now in the shelter i know is at capacity okay um, uh, actually july their numbers were the highest since they've opened really and they projected August to be the same. Mm -hmm. There are statistics showing that homelessness is going to rise over the, the next uh, few months mm -hmm. for various reasons, but I think sort of the, 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 the maybe the serve that was so wonderful is going to have an effect on some people being just in, in trouble as far as, you know, um, if, they're, if they're, are paying rent based on income and all of a sudden their income was boosted, now they're going to face, you know, higher income on their in a way and have to pay more rent so that's just one of the scenarios we've heard about um, and there'll be many more so. but but knowing that is there, is there an adjustment that can be made going back to pre-serve knowing full well that serve was it's going to be tricky i think mm -hmm. yeah. yeah i think one of the other things they can do like government um, has given permission that if it's like a one two night stay and we can start to work with people that they can be put into hotels for super short stay like one night to three nights so it gives you a little stop gap so people don't we don't want them setting up an encampment as you're talking about right but, like that's but that was an issue in Halifax oh, yeah. and, and the NDP leader stated that clearly at the protest yeah why are we paying for hotel rooms let's build units yeah affordable exactly. accessible units where they can live yes. and hopefully grow yeah. through this process that's, that's right. I look yeah. the hotel issue is it's been in Winnipeg, it's been yeah. in Edmonton, every jurisdiction. Yes. It's, yeah. it's been a challenge. It's not, it's it's not, not, it's not, not a solution. No, but, no. but in order to build as well, I mean, you, you need to acquire property. Yeah. Right. Yep. And, and property in, in, in Prince Edward, in Charlottetown, yeah. is, is becoming oh. very scarce. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, you know, it, there's, so, there's so many hurdles yes. that I don't think that there's this this no, it's gonna take some time silver bullet yes. that's going to solve it all. It's just we look a, forward to a vacancy rate of you know, five or yeah. five four, whatever yeah. that will help. But well, I think so, I think why. many do, but there's only one way to get there. There's only one way. To get there. As the population continues to grow, yeah. with immigration continuing to grow, yeah. there's only there's only one way. One way to get yeah. there. Yeah. And yeah. All right. Any other questions? I'm good. Thank you. Councillor Drawn, any questions? Thank you very much. No, I will. That's great presentation. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Any, anybody else? Thank you. Donna, thank you, Laura, thank thank you, thank you so much for coming in. If, if anyone uh, would like any more information, reach out at any time. Because the point is that, you know, uh, police services, knowing 
where do I send this person? So an open access site would be a perfect uh, place to. So we, uh, we do have some pamphlets drawn up and some cards that we can drop off to various organizations that aren't directly involved, but may come across people that are homeless. So, yeah, so we'll make sure we get some distributed around to different. And is there any chance that you can uh, forward that presentation even to? Uh, Definitely. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah. Okay. Perfect. Yeah. Well, thank you for having us. Okay. Thank, thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, sure. Okay, perfect. Yeah, more than likely. Yes. All right, folks, let's move on. So we're going to get right into reports. So we're going to start off with fire operational report. Chief. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chair. Operational report for July 28th uh, through to August 18th, 2021. Total uh, fire inspection for 28. Of that, uh, follow up inspections there were three, complaint inspections were fifth and were five, hazard compliance orders issued were 14, uh, there was one removal order issued, uh, inspections uh, files closed were five, plans review permits, safety plans, and consultations there were two, uh, engine one had done three visitations, uh, fire investigations <coughs> there were five, and uh, there were educational sessions and fire drills there were two conducted by the fire prevention uh, as well. Uh, the emergency responses, there was a total number of 56. Uh, the breakdown of that number in District 1 had 31 responses. District 2 had 17 responses. And the fire inspectors were called at eight times. Uh, weekly training is our reported last month spent for the summer months and will resume in September. And community activities, uh, there were none for the time period. Also, I have a few brief notes to share uh, with the committee as well. Uh, new ladder truck, uh, we received weekly photos of, of the construction of it, and they get circulated every Monday morning. That seems to be the time when they come in. Also, there will be a virtual final inspection of the truck uh, done on September 15th. And as well, there will be a live walk around of the vehicle done on either September 16th or 17th. Those Both are the dates are confirmed. Those are the trucks that we approved last year, right? That's the truck you approved last year. Yes, so, two. so virtual inspection. Uh, virtual inspection. Okay, so where are these being built, and is there an opportunity to to be there live for the inspection versus virtual, or is virtual good enough? Um, with our present COVID situation, uh, the truck the truck being built in Wisconsin, Appleton, okay. Appleton, Wisconsin, uh, at a plant there called Pierce. Okay. Now uh, we have the option to go to the site and view the truck <coughs> uh, the final inspection, which we've done in the past and other other trucks. Yep. And we've also done uh, the last two times uh, with pumpers. We do have visual or virtual inspections as well. So you so you're okay, comfortable with the visual. You've done it. Okay. <coughs> For the um, virtual. <laughs> also negotiations, as I reported last month, uh, we met with the union uh, seven times. Uh, on August 13th, the union chose to cease negotiations and proceed to con uh, conciliation. Uh, and I have no further update at this time. Those dates have not been confirmed when we were going to conciliation. Uh, the new fire station number three, uh, we had gone through the floor plan. Presentation was made to the committee on July 19th. Uh, now we are moving towards uh, 3D modeling and concept design for the interior. Uh, in initial equipment list and room data sheets. And we anticipate having our next meeting toward the end of this month. Uh, so we're waiting for that information to come. Uh, fire prevention bylaw, that uh, file does continue in advance. I have another meeting tomorrow, uh, Thursday with lawyers on it, or wordy. Well, that continues. Volunteer recruitment campaign, that will commence in September. And we're sort of thinking around September 20th target date. Uh, EMO, the all hazard plan has been updated and circulated. So that's up, up and running. <coughs> EMO, MOUs uh, are currently being updated. I think we have perhaps maybe three or four that are outstanding that have to be signed out and brought back. So that's what's coming about. Um, also from our last meeting, committee requested that I forward them a copy of the apparatus suggestion replacement schedule, uh, which I yep. emailed it out to everybody on August 4th. Also, our turnout gear tender has closed uh, yesterday, Monday, August 23rd, and we're we'll reviewing the tender as well this time. Perfect. So, that concludes my report. <coughs> Lots going on, Chief. Lots of calls in the air. <laughs> 
Any questions? Yes, Councilor Erickson. Yes. The replacement of Engine 2 and the replacement of Engine 4, Chief. Yes. Is that the units that are being built right now? No. So you're looking for two more units? Correct. For what time date do you are looking at that? If you look at the suggested replacement schedule, they're to be replaced in 2023. Uh, it does take time to prepare a draft uh, uh, RFP to be able to sit down with, it, with our team and go through it and then go to finance for review, then go to public and open RFP. Uh, it'll take about, probably a month to close it and have those numbers come back to <coughs> feel for what the truck will cost. So that would be a, a 2023 budget. Right. So theoretically, okay. we would probably go to tender probably this time next year, maybe June or July. Uh, get the information back and then issue a purchase order and take delivery of the truck sometime in 2023. Okay. No, I just wondered because since the two we have coming, it, there is a 2022 budget, so we're not having them all in the same year, I guess. Right. Uh, so the, one, the one that's being built now was the 22 budget, 2021 budget. Right. Uh, the one's coming, we would have to make that decision probably coming in the 2022 budget. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? You have to leave for a second? Pardon? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Can you stay? What's that? Do you want me to stay? No, no, we're, we're, you're good. You're good for them. Yep. Yeah. All right, any other questions? Didn't no, I'm good. Didn't know where you're going. <laughs> didn't know you leaving or coming back. <laughs> All right, Thanks. Councilor Duran, any questions? No, I'm great. Thanks. Great. Okay. All right. Thank you, Chief. All right, moving into police operational. Can you chair, um, calls for service uh, for August to date uh, this year, 1,303 calls for service. Um, which is, uh, compared to last year, we had 12 and 11, so pretty close to the, the COVID factors. Um, um, we, are, we are seeing an increase in uh, United Province traffic uh, in our city and province, so that's Factor also, um, we also want to uh, make uh, be aware that uh, we, uh, after receiving uh, lots of uh, positive feedback in relation to our community action team, we are looking. Our intention is to extend it beyond the pilot project for the summer in September. Uh, for, uh, cementing that as one of our uh, uh, one of our years uh, throughout the year. So. Um, and uh, using our, our two uh, two additional uh, bodies to uh, to do that. So, so the the pilot project ends in September. Is that right? Yeah. So, in order to have no hiccup with with that service, yeah. should we have something presented to council before September to make sure that, or as close as possible, to make sure because at, that at the end of the pilot, I'm assuming that we're not going to do the service. Until we get approval, budget-wise, or what's no, the, the, that's the internal been, piece that the chief has been, you know, the deputy has been working on, and so I presume there'll be a discussion here uh, before it goes up in Okay. So the positions uh, that were approved in last year's. Uh, yeah. Okay. That's not. I'm talking more the uh, yeah the community action. Right. Team. The, yeah. Those are the positions that, that will be utilized. Yeah. Okay. The community action team. Um, as part of the process internally, those positions, because of the formation of the unit within the service, the position will have to be posted. And uh, but we are expecting, um, you know, no breach, no, no disconnecting the service from the pilot and the start of the Okay. Okay. Seems to be working out well too. It really does, and I'm, I just want to yeah, make sure. That, I just want to make sure feedback. those services are still being, being um, offered during. The process of, of advertising and things of that nature and just make sure that we continue the service that there's no there's no gap is that so i presume we'll do an end report to let council know how it did work out and then uh, it is the intent to carry that program forward is that correct Deputy? yeah yeah this is the, the kind of notification of that so if uh, um, yeah we can put together a, a more uh, wholesome uh, presentation but uh, I think the evidence is in the feedback you're hearing from your decisions, and uh, we'll build around that out into a presentation. Okay. Okay. Uh, moving on to personnel, uh, with the, uh, 
uh, welcome Jim Braun into uh, our ranks at the CPS as our new uh, uh, civilian forensic examiner. He started his first day on uh, Monday, so uh, I think he's going to be a great asset to our team and uh, certainly uh, extend our capacity in the area of digital forensics. So, so Constable Curry's finally retired? No, that's it's a different uh, discipline of forensics. So that's the forensics of like uh, crime scene forensic. This is more cell phone forensics, computer oh, okay. forensics, that kind of. Right. Uh, we're still currently working with uh, HR on our entry uh, constable position. So uh, my understanding we've received uh, a number of uh, applicants that will be uh, interviewing uh, through the process. Our summer cadets have finished uh, their OJT training for the summer, so we had uh, um, you know, some great cadets and we wish them the best in, the, in their continued uh, training. Um, also, this is our final week for our summer students that are engaged in our safe schools and community program, so that are updating our safe plans and doing some 3D imaging of, of schools, so um, their they're last day is Friday, so uh, thank them for their, for their work over the summer and wish them the best in their in their upcoming school year. Uh, we also are uh, in, the, um, in the process of exchanging proposals with our uh, collective bargaining unit, and we're uh, meeting later this week uh, in discussions. Um, moving on to bylaw, um, the power assisted bicycle um, amendments to the bylaw will be uh, drafted in the uh, fourth. Uh, ready for the next uh, regular council meeting for the first reading. And now I'm going to turn it over to Deputy Coons to give you some community policing. Thank you, uh, Chair. Um, so I won't go any further into our community action team. I think we all can have a good flavor as to uh, what they're achieving this summer. Um, we do have one letter from Councillor McCabe. Um, from a constituent talking about um, the vast improvement on Herbert Street through uh, through their efforts, um, along along with enforcement uh, from the community perspective, uh, Constable Kaiser uh, participated in the scaled down version of the Little Cup of Sasha Parade. That was in both uh, the logistics and the operational side of that. Our uh, offender management officer, which is Constable Meisner, um, is responding to uh, bridge issues every Tuesday and Thursday, something that we discussed earlier with homelessness, and it's also community-based. Um, when he's not doing that, amongst other things, he's dropping into the outreach center um, on average at least three times a week and speaking with both staff and clients as to uh, how how it's being run down there and, and how we can assist. Um, we received a little bit of cooperation from Ocean 100 here with our final push on August 18th with our uh, name and mascot campaign. It's, uh, it's a big purchase for us, um, but we expect to get a lot of uh, use out of it over the next decade or so. Um, we're gonna have a, a big splash with uh, who the winning student was, and we've got some good uh, good names to pick from there. So we were really happy with the participation in that. Um, other than that, um, we had a cyberbullying and fraud talk. Uh, so on August seventh, Constable Kaiser, along with our uh, outreach worker Jane Wood, uh, addressed both youth and their parents on the danger of cyberbullying. In a later session, police spoke to realities of online fraud and special thanks to Tammy Rayner for organizing the event and she is a program uh, coordinator with PEI Military Families Resource. We also, um, we also participated in uh, an inner city life skills camp. This was founded by Lenny Sproy over 33 years ago. Charlottetown Police Service was proud to support the camp, which provides youth with a fun-filled, confidence-building environment using uh, activities and healthy lifestyles as our main focus. Just a few things in the community, and um, all these things can be seen on our website and on Twitter if you want to see the full stories. 
Thank Fire Rescue Community Action Team, just want to let everyone know that we're not bogging you down with it here in these meetings, but we're receiving daily updates on what all three members are doing. It's compiled. It's probably too much information even for the end of summer report, but um, if you do want to see it or go through it, they're, the officers are breaking down almost a daily occurrence of, of where they're doing their enforcement and, and how they responded to certain residents in the community. Yeah, it's 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 amazing. I'm hearing from so many of my residents. Right. Still, just I mean, we have we have uh, Dale Johnson in our area, and and uh, he's he's been fantastic and easy to get a hold of and returns calls quickly and you know there's there's times where I'll be on the phone with him and I can hear and then all of a sudden you know we'll have a a resident walk up to the car and ask him what he's doing <laughs> and then, you know, he'll ask me to wait a second and he'll have a, a chat with the uh, resident and you know I can hear firsthand how yeah. appreciative they are so uh, part, part of this program and part of it is who it's being staffed by like we've got some 100%. really uh, good people that are really found the niche of balancing off enforcement with community uh, concerns great personalities yeah they're, they're, they're exactly. perfect for the job yeah yep and uh, so we're really happy with the community action team, but uh, we're expecting big things from the offender management officer position too. Like uh, it's it's newer, yeah. But uh, we'll have more to report there, and you have to conceptualize that by him taking on the bridge, that's going to be freeing up our health, our school resource officers to do other things, so that they're not being taken out of the schools and that system to do bridge come September. So one sort of begets the other as time goes on. Perfect. Yeah. Very good. Um, before we go to the questions, uh, actually we can before we, we talk about uh, about unsightly premises. So any questions for? Just is it, yes, uh, so yep. thank you Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you gentlemen for your report. Is uh, the same officers going back to the two schools? Yes. As a, as a resource officers? For yeah. that? No indication that's going to be changed. Okay. No, I just wanted to, because, like, I know uh, the officer at Sherrard and Murrow, like, I dealt with her a few times, and a couple of things, and she's fantastic and all that. And, he, and the kids really enjoy her, or the students, I should say. I shouldn't say kids, but the students. Mm -hmm. They are going to be positions, but yeah. there's no indication it's going to be changed. Okay. Yeah, because it works out very well if the students are comfortable with the person that they know, I guess, or something that they come to them, or, you know, things along that line. I mean, sometimes in life, you know, when you change personnel up, you know, people are sort of hesitant. What we've done at this point is we've done a three-year rotation. Okay. Which seems to work. Yes. So, um, yeah. No, I'm not lobbying for the No one is, so, yeah. You know. We have at least one more year for uh, Constable McKay in yeah. a three-year rotation at Shelby Monroe. Right. Yeah. Okay. That's great. Thank you. All right, uh, Councillor Drawn, any questions? Yeah, just one quick one there, Greg. Thank yep. you for that. Um, I was just wondering if uh, the sign of Mount Road Road is broken, and I was just uh, the last month of the meeting about, I guess it's not going to be replaced until a uh, new budget. I'm wondering if we could see the affordable one in the space for uh, a certain amount of time until we get things organized. And if that's a possibility. You're referring to the speed sign, right? Yeah. That we talked yeah. about? Work. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. We're to sell them after this. Oh, I think it is. Do you want to? Dr. Hawk, Council Drawn, we are in conversation with Holman Burks in, in, uh, in getting one uh, deployed there. It may, it, uh, it may not be a data collection one, but uh, it will be uh, um, certainly a, a speed century in, in, in the in the morning of increased speed. Uh, so uh, uh, we are working on that and uh, we'll keep you up and informed uh, on the progress. That would be terrific. Thank you very much. Appreciate that. That's it for me, guys. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Councilor Drone. All right, so moving on to the next deal, unsightly premises uh, that was added to the agenda. Yeah. Uh, Councilor Duffy, do you want to kind of lead the charge on this? Yeah. Uh, this whole issue uh, is. Uh, Two two uh, two uh, properties on uh, University Avenue. One two one is two sixty nine University Avenue. The other property is uh, uh, actually has two uh, 
street addresses, 282 and 284 University Avenue. Approximately, uh, we, as we all know, we have a, a process here of dealing with unsightly premises, dilapidated premises, or dangerous premises. And that is basically the police department, uh, uh, in the, the normal role of duties, uh, sites, uh, properties that require cleanup or buildings that require cleanup. In this particular case, I was contacted by an individual uh, last September, so it's coming up the year anniversary. That these two uh, individual pieces of property with actually three residents on them uh, were uh, unsightly and he, he himself has an apartment uh, in the adjacent area which he keeps uh, very tidy and he was he was speaking to me saying that he had had some city officials and I'm not going to name people in this I'm just trying to get to the root of it to get this thing corrected some city officials had carried out an inspection there and they said that uh, there's not much they could do at this time uh, then uh, I was dealing with Mr. Kelly because I was also getting um, opinions from other people within Charlottetown, both residents of Ward 4, where they, these are located, and from business people in that ward, and indeed residents in other wards would come to me, because this is a main entrance to the city, and, and these buildings should, you know, reflect the, type, the care and attention that most of our residents give to the, their, their buildings, and this doesn't bode well for us. So, all of that to say that um, for a year, our bylaw enforcement officer has been working with the fire inspector over here and the bylaw enforcement himself, working with the family of the individual that owns both these properties. And uh, in a recent conversation with the bylaw officer, he said basically in his position, he, he can't take it much further than this. But I'm still getting comments at your Tim Hortons or at your Islander Hockey Games, not these days, but in the last couple of months. You know, people are, are concerned. Uh, why isn't it being done? The owner of the property has refused to do it. So I'm simply saying that we have a process in place where other people have refused to do it. We see two or three of these cases a month, not every month, but where the, the police have come forward to uh, request public works to clean up these properties at the city's expense. And uh, if they don't pay within 30 days or a lot of time, the expense that the city incurred, the city uh, just basically takes a, lien, a municipal lien against the properties. And I don't know why in this case this is this has gone on for a year uh, we've had other ones that have gone on for like 90 days but they've been gone through the process i don't know why this one is being treated in a different manner so That's, so I, i'm requesting that the police uh, for the next public meeting of council which i believe is the 13th mr kelly of september have a, simply a resolution put in there as everyone else who is in this boat has had, and let the city council deal with it as we have with, with the others. I, I don't understand you, okay. Mr. Chair. Thank yeah, you, Councilor Duffy. Um, so, Brad, do you did you get the addresses to? I did. Sixty nine. Uh, Follow up with our uh, lead to twenty four. Our uh, bylaw officer. Yeah, if if you could, and if they, if, like I said, if they're if they do deem them to be to be um, unsightly, and and then Councilor Duffy's right. I mean. Yeah probably should follow the same process as, as we followed on any property in Charlottetown that has been unsightly, so. Are both residents empty? No, one is. One building is empty. One building is empty and the other's That one building had five electric meters on it, and so there was supposed to be five tenants in this okay. building at one time. Those meters are gone, uh, and it's in disrepair. I mean, they stick out like a sore thumb, and, and uh, either deputy or the acting chief if you want to give me a call, give me a call after me. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Okay. Thank you, Councillor Duffy. All right. All right. Let's. Uh, we have a motion to move into a closed session as per Section 119, 1 B D E and H of the M G A. Pretty well. Move and check. Yeah. A B C. All right. Move. And second. Anyone a second? Okay. Perfect. All right. We'll move into a closed session.